Well, good morning, everybody. How are we doing today? Oh, good morning, Dries. How are things in the Netherlands? Andy, how are things in Tucson? Mike, good morning. Jill, good morning. How's our sound quality this morning? Anyone want to chime in? Mark, good morning. We got a full house. I'm sorry to hear that, Dries. Yeah, that's my chair most of the time. I'm always so glad everybody can join us. It's a, something I really look forward to. I hope you do too. Okay, let's see here what we're going to do. Hey, good morning, me amigos. And how is everyone doing today? I sure look forward to our Sunday morning visits, and I'm always glad that you can join us. This week on Coffee with Jim, it's a walk on the dark side of legendary Route 66. It's going to be uh, stories of murder, mayhem, and disaster on the most famous highway in America. Today, Route 66 is a, it's kind of viewed as a string of time capsules, uh, America's longest theme park, if you will. But in the pre-COVID era, and I'm sure it will be in the future, the highway was a destination for tens of thousands of international Route 66 enthusiasts seeking the romanticized image of an authentic American experience. And I'm confident that it will again be America's longest attraction. But before being replaced by the interstate, this was an artery of commerce, legal and illicit. It was traveled by vagabonds and vagrants, vacationing families and serial killers, hitchhikers and truck drivers, movie stars and murderers, escaped convicts and people that were simply seeking a better life in the promised land that was sunny California. Aside from stories that might keep you awake at night, we also have our weekly trivia contest. This week, the prize is a uh, defaced copy of my book, 100 Things to Do on Route 66 Before You Die. It's defaced with my signature, of course. Hey, we didn't have a winner last week on our program about US-6. 
The answer was Jack Kerouac, who wrote On the Road. It was published in April of 1951, and he talked a lot about U.S. 6 in that book. Before we begin our road trip in the shadows, let's take care of a bit of business, pay the bills, if you will. I want to give a hearty thank you to the boys of the road crew for our theme song. Check our music out at uh, roadcrew66.com. And I'd like to give a shout out to uh, some of our other sponsors. We have the uh, Wagon Wheel Motel in Cuba, Missouri. The very essence of the Route 66 experience is encapsulated at this delightful little time capsule. And uh, speaking of time capsules, how about a, a bit of 1960s swank? That's what you get at the Roadrunner Lodge in Tucumcari, New Mexico. The attention to detail in the property's renovation and careful way the vintage touch has been wrapped in modern amenities, it makes the place very special indeed. And as much as I hate to, I know this sounds like a PBS pledge drive, but crowdfunding is crucial to keeping this and our other Jim Hinckley's America programs going. It's also partially subsidizes other projects like the distribution of promotional materials for uh, Route 66 businesses, communities, and museums that are included with every book sold. It's our way of providing a promotional boost for the mom and pop businesses along Route 66. And it's our way of saying thank you for the support I provide uh, an array of exclusive content, as well as discounts on Kingman area walking tours and free access to some of our pay-per-view programs. Um, getting this show on the road, I should note that a lot of the stories I'm sharing today and others are available in my book, Murder and Mayhem on the Main Street of America. And uh, signed copies are available through our website, jimhinkleysamerica.com. Let's start with a story from Chicago. With a name like this, is it any wonder that this gangster was a very, very angry and hostile young man? On August 13, 1929, Chicago police captured Willie, babyface duty, in front of an apartment building on West Jackson Boulevard. The arrest marked the end of a 12-month murderous crime spree. On uh, May 28, 1929, Charles Levy, the chief of police in Berwyn, Illinois, and another officer were investigating a stolen vehicle, but during the arrest procedure, duty shot and mortally wounded Levy before making his escape. Three weeks earlier, duty had shot and killed a postal inspector in a hotel on the north side of Chicago. And uh, he was also wanted in connection to numerous robberies, car thefts, assaults. Two days after murdering Levy, Duty mortally wounded a restaurant owner on the south side of Chicago during a robbery. And uh, several weeks later, he stole a car and wounded a policeman in the process of making his getaway. And in August, he had robbed a drugstore on the corner of Adams and Wacker, and he had beat the... Uh, a pharmacist unconscious. Nice fella. <clears throat> and we have one more from Chicago. On uh, October 11th, 1925, in a garage on Ogden Avenue between Adams Street and Jackson Boulevard, Edward C. Shanahan died resulting of a gunshot wound to the chest. Shanahan was the first FBI agent to be killed in the line of duty. And for three months, his killer, Martin Durkin, eluded law enforcement in what was one of the first major investigations launched by the newly formed federal agency. At the time of his death, Special Agent Shanahan was investigating a series of interstate auto thefts, and Durkin was the primary suspect. On November 2nd, 1925, what started as a routine traffic stop ended in the death of Chicago Police Sergeant Harry Gray and the wounding of a second officer. Local, state, and federal law enforcement tracked Dirk into California, then into Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, and back to St. Louis. 
where he was apprehended on January 22nd, 1926. <clears throat> Excuse me, guys. Racial tensions resulted in some of the most horrendous crimes committed along in cities along what would become the Route 66 corridor in 1926. Perhaps one of the worst of these incidents occurred in East St. Louis in 1917. Carlos Hurd, a reporter who had gained fame in 1912 for his heart-wrenching interviews with survivors of the Titanic sinking, he wrote an eyewitness account which was published in the St. Louis Dispatch on July 3rd of 1917. He opened his feature with, quote, For an hour and a half last evening, I saw the massacre of helpless Negroes at Broadway and 4th Street in downtown East St. Louis, where black skin was a death warrant. His account continued, The East St. Louis affair, as I saw it, was a manhunt conducted on a sporting basis with anything but the fair play, which is the principle of sport. There was a horribly cool deliberateness and a spirit of fun about it. Get a, and the N-word, was the slogan, and it was varied by the recurrent cry, get another. As people fled and tried to swim the Mississippi River, people lined up on bridges and shot at people. Hugh Wood, a reporter for the St. Louis Republic, wrote, a Negro weighing 300 pounds came out of a burning line of buildings, and a man in the crowd clubbed the Negro in the face with a revolver. Another battered him with a rock. Then the Negro tumbled to the ground. The crisis featured additional articles that horrified readers with details of mayhem, brutality, and outright horror. A person nearly beheaded with a butcher knife. A 12-year-old African-American girl pulled from a trolley bus and beaten. Her mother attacked and left for dead. Among those brought to trial for the tragic events was Dr. Leroy Bundy, a dentist and prominent leader in the East St. Louis African-American community, who was formally charged with inciting a riot. Bundy, along with 34 defendants, of which 10 were white, were given prison time in connection to the riot. And this wasn't the only incident, of course. In Tulsa in 1921, a prosperous African-American community known as Black Wall Street was burned, and hundreds of people were killed in Springfield, Illinois, during a riot that left dozens dead, and um, hundreds of people homeless. These are all vicious and dark chapters in our national history, and uh, really tragic stuff. It's mileposts, though, on how far we're moving and progressing. I'd like to think, anyway. Oh, I want to give a shout-out uh, to Uranus. The best fudge comes from Uranus. Uranus Fudge Factory and General Store, a quintessential roadside attraction from the glory days of Route 66. It, it uh, gives you the impression of what life was like in the 1950s on Route 66. And uh, I want to thank Louis Keene for his generous support over the years. Next up, I have a very tragic and dark story that begins in Missouri. William Edward Cook, Jr. They called him Cockeyed Cook. He had a bad eye. He was born in Joplin, Missouri, 1928. And he never got, had a chance in life from the very beginning. His father's alcoholism ensured that the family lived in abject poverty. And his abusive nature kept the children living in fear. In 1933, Cook's mother died, and his father set up a home of sorts in an abandoned mine shaft. After his abandonment, Cook's siblings were all placed into foster care. William, with a, very, a deformed eye and violent temper, he was made a ward of the state. Cook was often arrested for truancy. And shortly before his 13th birthday, he spent his nights committing petty theft, shoplifting, and burglary in Joplin. After his arrest, he told the court that he wanted to go to reform school. On the day of his release, he robbed a cab driver of $11, and he was arrested that night 
and spent the next five years in reform school. Cook was a fiercely violent young man. In one brutal fight, he nearly beat a boy to death, an incident that led to his transfer to the Missouri State Prison. When an inmate teased him about the droopy eye, Cook beat him so badly the man was hospitalized for nearly a month. Released from prison in 1950, Cook returned to Joplin where he briefly reunited with his father. He then took to the road a few weeks later with an intention to quote, live by the gun and roam. He hitchhiked west on Route 66 to Los Angeles and then drifted to the small desert town of Blythe, California. Then he traveled to El Paso, Texas, where he acquired a snub-nosed 32 caliber revolver. On December 30th, 1950, Lee Archer of Lubbock picked him up in West Texas. This would be the beginning of a multi-state crime spree that would leave death and tragedy in its wake. Shortly after being picked up, Cook pulled his gun, robbed and beat Archer and locked him in the trunk. At a gas station, Archer used a tire iron to force the trunk open and made his escape. On Route 66 near Luther, Oklahoma, Cook ran out of money and gas and again took to the road as a hitchhiker. Carl Moser, traveling from Illinois to visit a brother in Albuquerque, New Mexico, with his wife, Thelma, and three children, Ronald, Gary, and Pamela Sue, and the family dog, they made a fateful decision. They stopped and gave Cook a ride. For at least 72 hours, Cook forced Moser to aimlessly drive around Oklahoma, West Texas, the Panhandle, and eastern New Mexico with the children and dog locked in the trunk. At a remote filling station near Wichita Falls, Texas, Moser attempted to overpower him, but Cook was a veteran of vicious prison brawls. A few days later, on January 3rd, police discovered the Moser's blue 1949 Chevrolet abandoned and hidden along Route 66 near Tulsa. The interior was awash in blood, and scattered among the refuse was a receipt in the name of William Cook, Jr., the man who had been identified as the kidnapper of Lee Archer. After abandoning the car, Cook headed west on Route 66, first by bus and then by hitchhiking. In Needles, California, he turned south toward Blythe. The multi-state manhunt commenced in earnest after discovery of the Moser's car. After learning that mud found in the Moser car came from mine tailings, similar to those near Joplin, police chief Carl Nutt and Joplin detective Walter Gamble began investigating abandoned mines. They soon made a gruesome discovery, the bodies of the Moser family and their family dog. The manhunt for Cook quickly became one of the largest in American history. Acting on a tip, Deputy Sheriff Homer Waldrop went to the motel where Cook had lived while working in Blythe. Cook overpowered the deputy, disarmed him, and took him hostage. Cook forced the deputy to drive aimlessly for hours while regaling the officer with details about his murderous crime spree. In a remote desert location, he ordered the deputy to pull over and lie face down in a ditch. Surprisingly, Cook simply took the man's wallet, got into the police car, and drove away, leaving the officer bound and gagged. That evening near the remote desert town of Ogilvy, California, Police located the stolen cruiser. It contained the body of a traveling salesman, Robert Dewey of Seattle. Police determined that Cook had killed Dewey for his Buick, which was found the next day abandoned near the Mexico-California border. Then came the report that Forrest Damron and Jim Burke, who had been prospecting in the Chocolate Mountains near Waldrop's abandoned patrol car, were missing. The end of Cook's murderous spree was undramatic. Two men from Santa Rosa Police in Mexico reported seeing a vehicle matching the description of the one belonging to Damron and Burke on the road to Tijuana with three men inside. After spotting the trio in Santa Rosa, police officers disarmed Cook without a struggle. 
and the terrified prospectors were unharmed. Initially, Cook professed innocence, but when confronted with evidence, he gleefully began providing chilling details of his trail of abduction and murder. Extradited back to the United States, Cook was tried, convicted for the kidnapping and murder of the Moser family, and sentenced to 300 years. A second trial for the murder of Dewey took place in California, and Cook received the death penalty. On December 12, 1952, he was executed in the gas chamber. The James Burke and Forrest Dameron kidnapping was dramatized the following year in a movie, The Hitchhiker, released in 1953. I have one story to share with you. It's not quite as gruesome and a little bit uh, lighter side, if you will, and it predates Route 66, but it pre provides uh, some insight into the ghost town of Indy, New Mexico. And after this, I'm going to share a story about some missing tourists. One of the more baffling and unusual stories I encountered doing research for my book, Murder and Mayhem on the Main Street of America. Indy, New Mexico, for those Route 66 fans, enthusiasts, you know that is the little ghost town just to the west of Indy, or west of Glen Rio, across the uh, New Mexico-Texas state line. This is a quote from the Santa Fe, New Mexican, May 2nd, 1906. Two arrests were made a week ago, which it is believed by Captain Farnoff of the Mounted Police, the beginning of the end of cattle rustling gang that has been going on in the eastern part of the territory for some time. After a month's chase, including the following of old trails over dangerous mountain passes and lying for hours in wait for the desperados, Mounted Police arrested John Fife and Tom Darlington, said to be the head of a gang of outlaws whose depredations have cost ranchers thousands of dollars. The arrest was made at Indy, 40 miles from Tucumcari, a thinly settled country into which the Mounted Police had never ventured. As a little bit of an historic footnote, and you know, like I say, my pa always said, better to fill the head with useless knowledge than no knowledge at all. This was the last use of a horse-mounted posse in New Mexico. Uh, this next story is, like I say, it's one of the most intriguing stories I uncovered while doing research for the book. And it's a crime that sparked the largest manhunt in New Mexico history. And the disappearance remains unsolved, and more than 70 years later, state investigators continue to seek clues. From the perspective of the Great Depression, George Lorius, an executive with a coal and ice company in East St. Louis, Illinois, was relatively uh, wealthy. In spring 1935, Lorius, his wife Laura, and good friends Albert and Tilly Herberer set out on a grand adventure west along Route 66 with plan stops in Vaughan, New Mexico, to meet with a friend and a side trip to Boulder Dam on their way to San Diego. Lorius mapped the trip carefully. He had his 29 Nash sedan serviced for the trip. Postcards mailed from Miami and Sayre, Oklahoma, regaled family and friends with stories from their adventures on Route 66. On May 21, 1935, they checked into the Vaughn Hotel in Vaughn, New Mexico. The next morning, they had breakfast in the hotel's cafe. They checked out and vanished. Almost the entire state de police department was eventually involved in the manhunt. Reportedly, the FBI created a file that was nearly six feet high. New Mexico Governor Clyde Tingley posted a $1,000 reward for information, leading to resolution of the mystery, and authorized the use of National Guard troops to assist in the search. A few days later, some of the couple's luggage was found smoldering in a pile east of the Knob Hill area of Albuquerque. Then, more luggage was found dumped along the highway near El Paso, Texas. And on May 29th, Loris's badly damaged Nash was found abandoned in Dallas, Texas. 
The Albuquerque FBI field office assigned Albert Raymond Gear to the case. Vague clues gave hints that Lorius had followed Route 66 north from Santa Rosa and through Santa Fe to Albuquerque. Examination of his car gave no indication of a struggle or violence. Gear found receipts and a notebook with odometer readings in Lorius's handwriting. The last entry was from a service station in Socorro, New Mexico, south of Albuquerque, dated May 23rd. Agents investigated every service station from Vaughn to Santa Rosa, along Route 66 into Albuquerque, and south to Socorro. Only one station, the last recorded stop, provided positive identification. Joseph War, uh, Josephine Ward, a clerk at the Sturgis Hotel in Albuquerque, contacted the FBI and claimed that the couples had arrived at the hotel late on the afternoon of May 23rd, inquired about rooms, and then after a discussion thanked her and said they decided to drive on to Gallup. Gear expanded the investigation along the highway from Vaughn to Socorro and west along Route 66 to the Arizona state line. There were claims of sightings in Madrid, Grants, and Gallup, New Mexico. Then the tra trail just simply went cold. By July 4th, with nothing new to report, the disappearances faded from newspapers. By the end of the year, only family and agent Gear were still looking for answers. In an interview published in the Socorro Chieftain in July 1947, Gear said that his biggest regret was his inability to solve the Lorius and Heber, Heber disappearances. Here's where it really got me. This is what really made the hair stand up on the back of my neck. He also noted that there had been several investigations into the reported disappearance of more than a dozen travelers along the Route 66 corridor from Tucumcari and Flagstaff between 1934 and 1938. The cases all had disturbing similarities. In 2010, the Albuquerque Journal published a two-part feature on the case and the family's ongoing search for answers. Well, I've got, uh, we're running a little, I'm running a little tight. I try to keep this to a half hour so I don't wear out my welcome. But how about one more? <clears throat> this is an odd story, and I found during my research. On October 4th, 1919, about 25 miles west of Seligman, uh, along the National Old Trails Road, a shepherd turning a flock, uh, tending a flock, made a startling discovery, the smoldering body of a man. Now get this, now this isn't odd. Yavapai, Yavapai County Sheriff's Department investigators determined that the victim had been shot in the back of the head with a 38 caliber pistol wrapped in a blanket, dragged about 100 feet from where a car had been parked, doused with gasoline and set afire. Now here's where the story really takes a bizarre twist. Officers determined that the victim was wearing a uniform with insignia from the 20th Canadian Battalion of Infantry. Canadian authorities provided the clues that helped identify the deceased as Arthur de Studener. During the investigation, his sister-in-law said, quote, he answered an advertisement about a month ago and met a man who offered him $10 a week and expenses to make a car trip through the western United States. Arthur's sister met this man and warned him against going. The stranger who had hired Snadner was Nick Nikon Martin, a 25-year-old Armenian immigrant from Turkey. Martin had a prominent crimson wine birthmark on his cheek, which made him easy to identify. Desk clerks, service station attendants, and waitresses along the National Old Trails Road confirmed that the two men were traveling together. Investigators also learned that Martin and DeSnudner had been funding their trip with the robberies of remote rural stores. Interestingly enough, a few days before the body was discovered, the men had been arrested, suspicion of theft in Holbrook, held in jail but released because of a lack of evidence. 
On the evening of October 4th, Martin registered as Harry Dyer at the Commercial Hotel in Kingman, Arizona. The night clerk at the hotel later said, Martin's talk around the Kingman Hotel all centered about the impossibility of getting a companion for his automobile ride across the country and his standing offer to take anyone along who would pay for the fuel and oil for his machine. Martin was arrested in California on October 15th. In his possession was DeSnodner's bloodstained luggage and a 38 caliber revolver. Martin claimed that he and his partner had parted ways at an Ash Fork. Extra denied to Arizona to stay in trial, Martin attempted to escape near Needles, California by jumping from the train, and he was captured west of town. His trial began in Prescott on March 25th, 1920, and four days later he was found guilty of first-degree murder, and on Friday, September 9th, 1921, he was executed. Okay, then, you know, as interesting as these things are, I think that's enough of the macabre and gruesome for today. Uh, let's get to our trivia contest. The commercial hotel in Kingman, Arizona was raised about 1952. Um, it served as a hotel for many, many years. It's in a, a 1928 AAA guidebook I have. But what was this building's original purpose? First right answer gets a copy of 100 Things to Do on Route 66 Before You Die, defaced with my signature. Next week on Coffee with Jim, we're going to be talking epic road trip adventures. And I have some absolute doozies for you. I cannot believe some of the things that these people did with automobiles. Uh, just absolutely, just craziness. Well, um, like I say, I try to keep this to about a half hour. So let's see if we got any questions, anything I can answer, and, and uh, we'll go from there. Well, we've got Mr. Dries Bessels with us from the Netherlands, and Andy from all the way from uh, Tucson, and Mike's with us. Jill, I think this is the first time you've joined us. Good morning. Mark with us from back in the cold, windy Indiana. And David, good morning. Yeah, Andy, I do squeak a bit, but that is my chair. Oh, Dries, we would love to have you visit Route 66. The weather here is miserable, too. Um, actually, it's going to be 75 degrees today and snowing on Thursday. We're back to having all of our seasons in one week. Jim Featherstone, good morning, sir. Angela, good morning. Greece, this is somebody I think you need to meet. Angela is, um, and I have not met in person yet, but I'm eager to. She is the owner of the Cactus Inn Motel in McLean, Texas. And from what I could see of her video a few weeks ago, they're doing a marvelous job of giving this property a new lease on life. And of course, the Red River Steakhouse is just a spit and hop down the road. So you're assured a restful night's sleep and a good dinner. Andy, yes, I've been following your exploits, and uh, man, murder and mayhem in Mojave County. God bless. I tell you what, lots and lots of things happened around here. Good morning, Mr. Kentner. Daniel, how are you doing today? Oh, you're here in Kingman today, John. Wonderful, wonderful. Bill, you're all down in Belize. I've heard a lot of good stuff about Belize. Nolan, yeah, uh, the Tulsa race riot, riot is uh, pretty well known, but uh, the East St. Louis somehow was obscure, and it was it was just it was horrendous. It never ceases to amaze me how people what people can do to other people. All the way from Toronto, Canada. Well, good morning, and Jerry. Oh my goodness, all the way from Bavaria. My dear friend, how are you? First time for Chicagoland. Wonderful. 
uh, hit and miss on the COVID vaccine. I'm trying to get it from my, my dearest friend. Uh, I probably won't be able to, uh, I probably won't be able to get the vaccine till summer, it looks like. Drees, uh, yeah, I, I, I hope to be staying there too. I hope to be on the road this year, but boy, it's, uh, man, I just don't know. Ian, I'm sorry you're postponing your Route 66 till, till next year. Um, you know, a lot of people are having to do that, and it, it's really heartbreaking. And uh, the, 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 the silver lining, if there is one, is that uh, Americans are rediscovering the road trip. And uh, that's a good thing. Maybe we can get them out on Route 66 and other great two-lane highways and, uh, and uh, discovering the great mom-and-pop places like the Cactus Inn and McLean. And uh, Dries, I don't know what to tell you. You may have to change your name to Gonzalez and try to come in from Mexico. I'm just joking, of course. But uh, Anyway. Uh yeah, it's, I think 2020 really has changed a lot of people's perspective about uh, road trips, not putting off things until another day. And uh, it's going to be interesting to see the long-term ramifications of COVID. I hope we didn't uh, uh, cause too many uh, sleepless nights with our stories today. Uh, the most intriguing story, though, like say, I, I found was uh, the, the, the glorious disappearance in New Mexico. Uh, there's a lot, I put a lot more in the book, and a lot I didn't even have room to put into the book. But it's really, really a fascinating story how four people like that could just vanish. But like say, what? Uh, well, I hope so, Mr. Drees. Yes, we got beer to drink, places to show you. Uh, the Laureus disappearance was interesting, but what really got to me was, was the stories that all these other tourists had disappeared along Route 66 from Tucum Carry to Flagstaff uh, during that period. And uh, it, it, was, it was really... Uh, gave me a lot to think about, you know, if you will. And uh, uh, Drees, I have some other things for you that I'll try to round up and scan for you. But I have the, uh, I have the uh, court transcripts from the uh, murder in Two Guns, uh, Indian Miller in Cundriff. I have the uh, court transcripts. And I'll get those, see if I can get those scanned up for you. Um, next week, like I say, we're going to be talking road trips. And uh, to give you an idea, these aren't all old road trips. Some are. But uh, I've, I've got some stories from uh, the 30s, the 40s, the 50s. Uh, the uh, uh, Mexican-American uh, road race, 51, 52, uh, down through Mexico. And uh, <laughs> just amazing what these guys did with these cars. And uh, uh, Alexander Winton's. Uh, attempt in 1901 to be the first person to drive coast to coast for supporters of our crowdfunding initiative. Uh, you've already heard this story. I posted it in its entirety from Scientific American. And uh, I think uh, I think you're going to find these interesting. We've got uh, stories of uh, a young lady that traveled all over the uh, 48, lower 48 states in the 1930s and 40s on a Harley Davidson. And uh, we'll see how much we can crowd in next week. Hey, before I wrap this up, uh, do I, any questions I can answer for anybody? No? Folks, I am always so glad that we can get together, and I do look forward to the time when we can get together again in person. Uh, as much as I enjoy doing these things, it's uh, it's just not quite the same. And uh, <clears throat> I'm going to take another stab at doing some presentations on Zoom to make it a little more interactive. And uh, I'd sure appreciate everyone chiming in and, and uh, letting me know what you think about that. 
uh, what your your ideas and thoughts are. It's uh it's been really interesting because I joke about being modern Amish and trying to em embrace embrace all these new technologies. But I uh, hope you can join us next Sunday. Invite your friends, uh, and uh, we'll have some fun. Mark, thank you. It's something I'm, I'm glad you enjoy it. And uh, yeah, we'll see everybody next week, and we'll, we'll do this again. Oh, excellent, Angela. Thank you. I'm glad you got that okay. Yeah, uh, the book Murder in, uh, excuse me, 100 Things to Do in Route 66 Before You Die is, uh, it's a simple little book, almost a pocket guide. Uh, and uh, it's fun. I hope a lot of these restaurants survive. I found out the four-way in Cuba did not survive this. Uh, Ian, you know, Zoom is a great, a great idea. I like it. Uh, the problem I've had with live streaming to Facebook, I have encountered some issues, and I, I've uh, we tried this most recently when I was teaching at Mojave Community College. We ran into some problems from there, and uh, I'll get it figured out. We'll see if we can make that happen, guys. Folks, via Candios, and we'll see you next week. Adios.